Stories, fables, ghostly tales. Centaur is a man who does not wish to die, looking for a way to escape, to cheat, to avoid death, searching for an elixir of life. But will he find what he's looking for? Welcome, listeners. And today I have for you a Japanese folk story just for your ears, titled The Man Who Did Not Wish to Die. I'm currently sculling my Earl Grey tea that I've added a dash of maple syrup to, to give it some sweet kick. And I'm glad I did. Maple syrup is so heartwarming. It's like adding honey to a hot drink. It feels like your chest is covered in a warm blanket. So join me with an Earl Grey of your own, Turn off those lights and let me share with you a classic folk story from old Japan. Long, long ago, there lived a man called Sentaro. His surname meant millionaire, but although he was not so rich as all that, he was still very far removed from being poor. He had inherited a small fortune from his father and lived on this. Spending his time carelessly, without any serious thoughts of work, till he was about 32 years of age. One day, without any reason whatsoever, the thought of death and sickness came to him. The idea of falling ill or dying made him feel very wretched. I should like to live, he said to himself, till I'm five or six hundred years old, at least, free from all sickness. The ordinary span of a man's life is very short. He wondered if it was possible, by living simply and frugally henceforth, to prolong his life as long as he wished. He knew there were many stories in ancient history of emperors who lived a thousand years, and there was a princess of Yamato, who, it was said, lived to the age of 500. This was the latest story. Of a very long life record. Sentaro had often heard the tale of the Chinese king named Shin no Shiko. He was one of the most able and powerful rulers in Chinese history. He built all the large palaces and also the famous Great Wall of China. He had everything in the world he could wish for. But in spite of all his happiness and the luxury and the splendor of his court, the wisdom of his counselors. And the glory of his reign, he was miserable because he knew that one day he must die and leave it all. When Shin no Shiko went to bed at night, and when he rose in the morning as he went through his day, the thought of death was always with him. He could not get away from it. Ah, if only he could find the elixir of life, he would be happy. The emperor at last called a meeting of his courtiers and asked them all if they could not find for him the elixir of life of which he had so often read and heard. One old courtier, Jofuku by name, said that far away across the seas there was a country called Horizon, and that certain hermits lived there who possessed the secret of the elixir of life. Whoever drank of this wonderful drought lived forever. The emperor ordered Jofuku to set out for the land of Horizon to find the hermits and to bring him back a phial of the magic elixir. He gave Jofuku one of his best junks, fitted it out for him, and loaded it with great quantities of treasures and precious stones for Jofuku to take his presents to the hermits. Jofuku sailed for the land of Horizon. But he never returned to the waiting emperor. But ever since that time, Mount Fuji had been said to be the fabled horizon and the home of hermits who had the secret of the elixir. And Jofuku had been worshipped as their patron god. Now, Sentaro determined to set out to find the hermits, and if he could, to become one, so that he might obtain the water of perpetual life. He remembered that as a child, 
He had been told that not only did these hermits live on Mount Fuji, but were said to inhabit all the very high peaks. So he left his old home to the care of his relatives and started out on his quest. He travelled through all the mountainous regions of the land, climbing to the tops of the highest peaks, but never a hermit did he find. At last, after wandering in an unknown region for many days, he met a hunter. Can you tell me, asked Sentaro, where the hermits live who have the elixir of life? No, said the hunter. I can't tell you where such hermits live, but there is a notorious robber living in these parts. It is said that he is chief of a band of 200 followers. This odd answer irritated Sentaro very much, and he thought how foolish it was to waste more time in looking for the hermits in this way. So he decided to go at once to the shrine of Jofuku, who is worshipped as the patron god of the hermits in the south of Japan. Sentaro reached the shrine and prayed for seven days, entreating Jofuku to show him the way to a hermit who could give him what he wanted so much to find. At midnight on the seventh day, as Sentaro knelt in the temple, the door of the innermost shrine flew open, and Jofuku appeared in a luminous cloud, and calling to Sentaro to come nearer, spoke thus, Your desire is a very selfish one and cannot be easily granted. You think that you would like to become a hermit so as to find the elixir of life. Do you know how hard a hermit's life is? A hermit is only allowed to eat fruit and berries and the bark of pine trees. A hermit must cut himself off from the world so that his heart may become as pure as gold, and free from every earthly desire. Gradually, after following these strict rules, the hermit ceases to feel hunger, or cold, or heat, and his body becomes so light that he can ride on a crane or a carp, and can walk on water without getting his feet wet. You, Sentaro, are fond of good living and of every comfort. You are not even like an ordinary man, for you are exceptionally idle and more sensitive to heat and cold than most people. You would never be able to go barefoot or to wear only one thin dress in the winter time. Do you think that you would ever have the patience or the endurance to live a hermit's life? In answer to your prayer, however, I will help you in another way. I will send you to the country of perpetual life, where death never comes, where the people live forever. Saying this, Jofuku put into Sentaro's hand a little crane made of paper, telling him to sit on its back and it would carry him there. Sentaro obeyed wonderingly. The crane grew large enough for him to ride on it with comfort. It then spread its wings, rose high in the air, and flew away over the mountains right out to sea. Sentaro was at first quite frightened, but by degrees he grew accustomed to the swift flight through the air. On and on they went for thousands of miles. The bird never stopped for rest or food, but as it was a paper bird, it doubtless did not require any nourishment, and, strange to say, neither did Sentaro. After several days they reached an island. The crane flew some distance inland, and then landed. As soon as Sentaro got down from the bird's back, the crane folded up on its own accord and flew into his pocket. Now, Sentaro began to look about him wonderingly, curious to see what the country of perpetual life was like. He walked first round about the country, and then through the town. Everything was, of course, quite strange, and different from his own land. But both the land and the people seemed prosperous, so he decided that it would be good for him to stay there and took up lodgings at one of the hotels. The proprietor was a kind man, 
and when Centaro told him that he was a stranger and had come to live there, he promised to arrange everything that was necessary with the governor of the city concerning Centaro's sojourn there. He found a house for his guest, and in this way Centaro obtained his great wish and became a resident in the country of perpetual life. Within the memory of all the islanders, no man had ever died there, and sickness was a thing unknown. Priests had come over from India and China and told them of a beautiful country called Paradise, where happiness and bliss and contentment fill all men's hearts. But its gates could only be reached by dying. This tradition was handed down for ages, from generation to generation. But none knew exactly what death was, except that it led to paradise. Quite unlike Centaro and other ordinary people, instead of having a great dread of death, they all, both rich and poor, longed for it as something good and desirable. They were all tired of their long, long lives, and longed to go to the happy land of contentment called Paradise, of which the priests had told them centuries ago. All this Santaro soon found out by talking to the islanders. He found himself, according to his ideas, in the land of topsy turvydom. Everything was upside down. He had wished to escape from dying. He had come to the land of perpetual life with great relief and joy, only to find that the inhabitants themselves, doomed never to die, would consider it bliss to find death. What he had considered hitherto as poison, these people ate as good food, and all the things to which he had become accustomed as food, they rejected. Whenever any merchants from other countries arrived, the rich people rushed to them eager to buy poisons. These they swallowed eagerly, hoping for death to come, so that they might go to paradise. But what were deadly poisons in other lands were without effect in this strange place, and people who swallowed them with the hope of dying only found that in a short time they felt better in health instead of worse. Vainly they tried to imagine what death could be like. The wealthy would have given all their money and all their goods if they could but shorten their lives to two or three hundred years even. Without any change to live on forever seemed to this people wearisome and sad. In the chemist shops there was a drug in constant demand, because after using it for 100 years, it was supposed to turn their hair slightly grey, and to bring about disorders of the stomach. Centauro was astonished to find that the poisonous globe fish was served up in restaurants as a delectable dish and hawkers in the streets went about selling sauces made of Spanish flies. He never saw anyone ill after eating these horrible things, nor did he even see anyone with as much as a cold. Centaro was delighted. He said to himself that he would never grow tired of living, and that he considered it profane to wish for death. He was the only happy man on the island. For his part, he wished to live thousands of years, and to enjoy life. He set himself up for business and for the present never even dreamed of going back to his native land. As years went by, however, things did not go as smoothly as at first. He had heavy losses in business, and several times some affairs went wrong with his neighbours. This caused him great annoyance. Time passed like the flight of an arrow for him, for he was busy from morning till night. Three hundred years went by in this monotonous way. And then at last he began to grow tired of life in this country, and he longed to see his own land and his old home. However long he lived here, life would always be the same. So was it not foolish and wearisome to stay on here forever? Centaro, in his wish to escape from the country of perpetual life, recontacted Jofuku, who had helped him before when he was wishing to escape from death and he prayed to the saint to bring him back to his own land again. No sooner did he pray than the paper crane popped out of his pocket. Centaro was amazed to see that it had remained undamaged all of these years. Once more, the bird grew and grew till it was large enough for him to mount it. As he did so, the bird spread its wings and flew swiftly across the sea in the direction of Japan. 
Such was the willfulness of the man's nature that he looked back and regretted all that he left behind. He tried to stop the bird in vain. The crane held on its way for thousands of miles across the ocean. Then a storm came on and the wonderful paper crane got damp, crumpled up and fell into the sea. Centaro fell with it. Very much frightened at the thought of being drowned, he cried out loudly to Jafuku to save him. He looked around, but there was no ship in sight. He swallowed a quantity of seawater, which only increased his miserable plight. While he was thus struggling to keep himself afloat, he saw a monstrous shark swimming towards him. As it came nearer, it opened its huge mouth, ready to devour him. Centaro was all but paralyzed with fear now that he felt his end so near, and screamed out as loudly as ever he could to Jafuku to come and rescue him. Ah! Lo and behold, Centaro was awakened by his own screams to find that during his long prayer, he had fallen asleep before the shrine, and that all his extraordinary and frightful adventures had been only a wild dream. He was in cold perspiration in fright, and utterly bewildered. Suddenly, a bright light came towards him, and in the light stood a messenger. The messenger held a book in his hand, and spoke to Sentaro. I am sent to you by Jafuku, who in answer to your prayer, has permitted you in a dream to see the land of perpetual life. But you grew weary of living there, and begged to be allowed to return to your native land, so that you might die. Jafuku, so that he might try you, allowed you to drop into the sea and then sent a shark to swallow you up. Your desire for death was not real, for even at that moment you cried out loudly and shouted for help. It is also vain for you to wish to become a hermit or to find the elixir of life. These things are not for such as you. Your life is not austere enough. It is best for you to go back to your paternal home and to live a good an industrious life. Never neglect to keep the anniversaries of your ancestors and make it your duty to provide for your children's future. Thus will you live to a good old age and be happy. But give up the vain desire to escape death, for no man can do that, and by this time you have surely found that even when selfish desires are granted, they do not bring happiness. In this book I give you there are many precepts good for you to know. If you study them, you will be guided on the way I've pointed out to you. The angel disappeared as soon as he had finished speaking, and Centaro took the lesson to heart. With the book in his hand, he returned to his old home, and giving up all his old vain wishes, tried to live a good and useful life, and to observe the lessons taught to him in the book and he and his house prospered henceforth. Wow, this is one Japanese story that feels so unique. The country of perpetual life. I'm sure when this story was circulated, it was a hit. I don't really encounter many folk stories like this, but this story shares some creative aspects with Greek mythology and the elixir of life, of course. I also really love the creativity around the paper cranes, flying Centaur to a distant land, a magical land, and then it being a dream the whole time. And funnily enough, when I read this story, the dream aspect by Chafuku didn't feel contrived in any way. And that's something that's certainly unique with this story, and its ability to get away with pulling the wool over the audience's eyes. And the elixir of life part has me thinking of doing some Greek mythology on the podcast. Hmm, what do you think? Would you enjoy some Greek myths, plus some Japanese folk stories, and research into cryptids? If you have a favorite topic from Greek mythology, or Japanese folk stories, or any horror fiction, feel free to email me your thoughts. Send it directly to me in my inbox at storiesfablesghostlytales at gmail.com. Nothing I love more than reading recommendations and reviews sent to me via email. And feel free to message me in any platform you like, whether it be SoundCloud, YouTube comments, but also Facebook. So Ryan Knight is one such listener and narrator 
that messaged me directly, who left a lovely heartwarming message on Facebook for me. I'll read it out to you all now. Hey SFGT, I got turned on to your channel through the Mr. X collaboration you did. I hear often you mention Earl Grey T in your shows, so being a narrator myself, I tried it. I'm totally hooked on it, and I use it now, before and during my recordings. Love the stuff. As well as being a big fan of the show, I can really get behind a great storyteller. Thank you my friend, and keep it going. Thanks for your time. Well thank you Ryan for such a lovely message and brilliant compliment. I really appreciate it. This is exactly the kind of interactions that I love having with my listeners. And on that, I'll be doing shoutouts this week. Oh, and before I forget, goodness, over the past 5 plus days I've been without internet, so right now you're hearing me because I'm uploading off my phone bandwidth. I refuse to miss an upload date. So, to all my awesome listeners out there, who are wondering why I've not responded of late, Australian internet problems. We essentially have a potato with wires stuck in it that we call the internet, and the government every now and then pokes it, exclaiming that we indeed do have the internet. Occasionally this potato ceases to potate, and therefore, no internet mate. So bear with me lovely ghouls and ghasts on my response time, I'll do my best to get back to you, and upload on time. And stick with me Wednesday, where I share a different kind of story altogether. So as always my lovely listeners, till next time.